So Ed Brown is a veteran researcher in the Bigfoot genre. He was a co-founder of the International Bigfoot Conference and the host of a popular show, Sit Down with Ed Brown, on the Big Truth channel on YouTube, as well as the show Sasquatch Encounters, and available on the same channel. Ed has traveled the country and research, researched in over a dozen states while visiting some of the best known hotspots in the cryptid, paranormal, and UFO genres. He recently finished filming and directing a documentary that is currently in post-production at a property, about a property in Florida that has very similar activity as the famous Skinwalker Ranch. And uh, that sounds kind of spooky. Um, with a degree in criminal investigations, he knows and understands the smallest details in any encounter or experience can change the face of the entire genre. Ed prides himself on the fact that he's extremely open-minded and feels that having an open mind to other ideas and theories is the missing link to furthering the research and finding answers to some of the great mysteries, and we certainly agree with that. He's excited to go over some of the evidence he's collected over the years and so many great research, with so many great researchers in different genres and show why keeping an open mind is so important. So with that, uh, if you guys would put your hands together and welcome Ed Brown. How's everybody doing tonight? Everybody hear me okay? I'm gonna have to get a chain here to kind of hold me down because I'm used to kind of wandering around. I'll end up over here and over here. But if I do wander off, I'll try to talk louder so everybody can hear me, okay? If you can't hear me, just let me know. But I do want to say, Steve, thanks, man, for, the, for letting me come. I had to grovel and beg for about three months to get him to come down and let me speak. And uh, he finally, I think he had an open spot and said, you know what? <laughs> we, we need one more person, Ed. So he let me come down, and I definitely appreciate that. My idea of research is it's all about keeping an open mind. So I'm going to do a little little test here real quick, just to show hands, all right? If you believe what I'm about to tell you, raise your hand. Fair enough? All right. See, you guys are already getting me. No? Okay. So if I told you there was um, a worm, okay? And this worm lived up in the Arctic. All it did was eat ice, made its way through ice, and that's all it did. And I said, if you went up there and you grabbed one of these worms and you took it back to your house, it would melt and just go down the drain like water when it got to 32 degrees. Would you believe that? I see a few hands up. It is absolutely true. There is a worm called the ice worm. I don't have it on here, but you can Google it. I promise you. It's a very cool thing. And, it's, and, it, and it goes back to there's so many things that we just don't understand, and we have to keep an open mind. I actually thought more people would believe me just because of my smile, but I was wrong. So we're, we'll move on. First, we must know what it means to be open-minded. And I, and I love quotes, by the way, so I kind of hit a few of them in here. Where there is an open mind, there will always be a frontier. Love that. One never goes so far as when one doesn't know where he's going. Tell me that's not research, right? Having an open mind is simply the ability to listen and recognize the views and opinions of others, especially when their views and opinions differ from yours. It is the only way we learn. Because if you don't know something, you have to trust the person telling you in order to learn it or experience it yourself. The people who are experiencing themselves are the ones going out and deep in the woods and having a lot of fun, and then we hope that everyone else believes us when we tell you what, we have, what happened to us. So uh, without the ability of having an open mind, we can no longer consider ourselves researchers. And you know, Steve and I were having that conversation, what, a couple weeks ago, Steve, about when you stop being open-minded and you stop thinking about, un, un, let, me, let me rephrase that. When you stop researching, okay, when you're, you think you know the answers and you're just working to prove yourself right, not find the answer, then you're no longer a researcher, now you're working on a hypothesis, okay? So it's very important, if you're, if you're going to research, great. If you're going to work on a hypothesis, that's fine too, but call yourself a hypotheticist, I guess. You know, we don't, because you're not a researcher because you're not open-minded. By all means, let's be open-minded, but not so open-minded that our brains fall out. 
so there is there is a wire or a line to walk. You know, there's some things that, you know, I, I, I was I was interviewing a guy one time about a uh, Bigfoot sighting he had, and he was telling me how he walked up on it and he said it jumped straight up about 60 feet in the air onto a branch. It was about this big around, and he said then it started swinging through the trees and it disappeared and like just disappeared, disappeared. Okay, now. I consider myself a pretty open-minded person, but 60 feet is a long way up. <laughs> you know, it's a long way to go. So it is important to understand that you have to pick and choose what you believe, and that's everybody's right to do that, you know? So anyway, we're gonna go ahead and get started here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow my own research and see how, you know, keeping an open mind it has kind of led me through this progression over the years, all right? And uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna skip around to a couple different genres in here as well, which is kind of cool, you know, because we've had some pretty cool things, right, Ryan? <laughs> Ryan was with me in Florida, and I'm gonna, I'm saved the best for last, so it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be pretty interesting when we get there. Hopefully it's all interesting. But remember, keep an open mind, all right? Obviously everybody remembers the, the famous Patty footage, Bigfoot, right? Well, that was um, recorded by um, Bob Gimlin and uh, Roger Patterson. Roger Patterson, unfortunately, passed away in 71, but Bob and I actually became pretty good friends, and uh, he's, uh, he's a great guy. We actually got him out and researched. I actually thought that picture was next, but it's not, so I kind of threw myself off. But we're going to start off in Kentucky, 2014, all right? And this is in Harlan County. Beautiful, beautiful area, all right? I mean, this is very wooded. Um, that particular time that I went up there, it was a lot different than what you see in that picture. There was actually about this much snow, all right? And it all came overnight, which was a, kind of a shock. I knew it was gonna snow. And we actually went a little early, hoping we could kind of beat the snow. The next morning, we were in a uh, Suburban, by the way, which everybody knows is a really big vehicle, right? Uh, the next morning, we couldn't find it. <laughs> you know, that's how much snow there was. It was pretty crazy. So I got up that morning, and I went outside. And see, this is when I want to wander off when I'm telling these stories. I love it. I, uh, I go outside, and I'm all bundled up. And I'm, I realized pretty quickly that I wasn't going to get a, real far away because it was just, we're in the mountain. We got this little cabin. Uh, the snow's just deep, you know, every step I took, there's logs underneath, I'm twisting my ankles, you can't see where you're going. It's rough, it's hard. But through binoculars, up the mountain, right behind the cabin, I see a trackway. Now it could have been a rabbit, could have been a deer, could have been a Bigfoot, I have no idea what it was. But I wanted to go up and take a look. So I decided to start making my way around, you know, I'm trying to get up this mountain behind the cabin. It just wasn't working. And I found this little trail that kind of wound up the mountain that way. Now I'm six foot, 230 pounds, fairly healthy guy. And I'm on my hands and knees, literally on my hands and knees, crawling through this snow, okay? It was that important to me. I wanted to see it. You gotta see it for yourself, you know? So as I'm doing this, I hear a very definitive, extremely loud, solid piece of wood hit another solid piece of wood. Crack! And I froze. And I sat there for a minute. And I'm like, okay, do it again. I want to know where it came from. <laughs> you know, I wasn't ready for it. Do it again. And I sat there for a few minutes. <laughs> I probably looked like an idiot out there in the snow like this. You know, waiting what seemed like several minutes, it was probably more like 10 or 15 seconds. I didn't hear it again. And I kind of rolled over and I'm sitting in the snow now facing the other mountains. And I took out my binoculars and I'm scanning the mountains. And now remember, I'm crawling through snow. Six foot, 230 pounds, healthy guy, crawling through snow. And I see a figure walking down the side of a mountain probably a mile and a half away from me as the crow flies through binoculars. And I, he only looks like he's about that big, but he's walking like this. 
Now I'm pretty shocked. I'm going, what am I looking at? You know? And I had a camera around my neck that I could have taken a picture of, a very, very nice camera. I could have taken a picture, taken a video. I could have zoomed in, probably got great detail, probably would have been one of the best pictures or videos ever of a Bigfoot. But when you first see one, your mind doesn't work that way, all right? I'm, I'm looking at this thing through binoculars and what I'm thinking is, what am I looking at? You know, could it be a man? Could there be a trail there that I just, that's just not where I'm at? You know, it is pretty far away. It is possible. He goes down behind these bushes uh, and it's, it's just like dead bushes really, it's just limbs. And I'm assuming he turned and went down the other side because it was about then that I decided, hey, I can take a picture. So I grab my camera and I get it ready and he never comes out the other side. Now that's, you know, that's, that's the Bigfoot story. You know, that happens. Now I, I'm very careful, at least for most of my career in Bigfooting, to not say I saw something if I don't know exactly what it is. So I cannot say 100% sure I saw a Bigfoot. I can tell you that I saw a bipedal something walking down a mountain with absolutely no problem whatsoever through the exact same conditions I was crawling on my hands and knees in. So that's what I saw, <laughs> all right? Um, so we got, the, you know, we got the wood knock, I, I, I saw the thing walking. Um, oh yeah, it was uh, the night before, and I forgot to mention this, the night before, it was almost like rocks hitting the side of the cabin. Now my brother was with me and his wife and, it was, and myself, just three of us in the cabin, and I, I'm sitting watching TV and the wall to the cabin is like right here and it sounded like it hit the wall. Now there was no window, it couldn't have seen me sitting there so it was just random I guess. But a rock hit the side of the cabin and my brother told me the next morning that it happened to him as well. So, so that's two of those that we never saw. Now I'm, I've got kind of a curious nature, right? So I'm like, you know what, there's snow out there. If a rock was thrown and hit the cabin, there's going to be a hole where that rock went. It's going to hit the cabin, bounce into the, rock, in the snow. So I'm out there, you're freezing, cold, and of course there's no hole. So what hit the cabin, I have no idea. So there's just these things that happen sometimes that you just can't put your finger on, you know? And you're like, man, well, how, does, how is that possible? If a rock was thrown, it had to leave a hole in the snow, and it didn't. So that was kind of cool. Did see the trackway behind the cabin, did have the solid wood knock, and of course a visual sighting of something walking down the side of the mountain. So for me, Bigfoot is flesh and blood. I saw a, an animal, just as real as bears, walking down the side of a mountain, and, I, and it made a noise. So all the evidence I had to this point was physical evidence I saw something, I heard something, and we even got rock stone at the cabin. So that was pretty cool. So, so far, for me, Bigfoot is real. It's flesh and blood, real as bears. Then I go to Washington. Now this is up in Grace Harbor. Has anyone here ever heard of the Grace Harbor film? No? This is really, really cool. One of my favorite videos I've ever seen. Um, this is a Grace Harbor right here. Again, beautiful area. It's beautiful. This is a still shot of that film. Now, I didn't ask them permission, so, you know, but I, I know them pretty well, and I'm sure they'll be okay with it. Can everybody see the eyes on that? The huge chest muscles, the shoulder muscles, <laughs> the little, whatever that is in the middle of the head, sagittal crest, I guess. That's insane. So I had to go there and check it out, you know. So I get there. Nicest couple you'll ever meet in your life. Jonathan and Sarah Brown, no relation. Just they, they were great hosts. Uh, just great, great people. We went out that night, and uh, they researched a little differently than I did. You know, I, when I researched, I went out, and I went out looking for Bigfoot, Right. They just go outside and hang out, and Bigfoot comes to them, you know? 
So I'm like, man, this is, I got to move here. <laughs> you know, this is great. So they get this film, and I'm, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, so I call them up, and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm going to be in the area. Do you care if I come by? And they're like, yeah, come on, you know. So we go out there, and that night was, was uh, pretty interesting. Did hear, now let me kind of explain kind of why you only see half of this real quick, because it is important. Right where the chest is, there's actually, there's a hill that kind of comes like this and then comes down, and there's a big tree about halfway up that hill. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So there's this big tree about halfway up that hill, and it was standing, apparently, with his hand on the tree, standing with his knees down like this and leaning forward towards the top of that hill. So at the top of the hill, you only see this much of it because the rest of it's down. And I've actually gone there and I stood in that exact spot. I've been where the film, where the cameraman was. I've been where the creature was standing. And you, and by the way, again, I'm six foot and uh, you see me about here. <laughs> so, so this thing is obviously a lot taller than I am. This thing's probably at least seven, seven, six, something in that neighborhood, seven and a half. So, um, so that night we were there, we did hear heavy footfall coming behind that hill, but down at the bottom of the hill. Now, I, again, my technique of research is you hear something, see something, you go find out what it is. That way, when you talk to people, you can say, I heard that, and then I got this to prove it. You know, that wasn't there, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So we sat down, had a beer, and enjoyed the, the night. So we heard the footfall. Then the couple really weird things happened. And, and I'm still kind of shaking my head going, man, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to explain these things. To this day, I still don't know how to explain these two things. At one point, we were standing there, and I was standing here. Sarah was standing between Jonathan and I, and Jonathan was over there. And uh, all of a sudden, in the middle of the woods, a light just came on and then turned off. It was as if... Someone had flipped a switch and turned on a porch light and then turned it off. Now, it wasn't super bright. It didn't illuminate all the woods. It was very defined, like a basketball, but it, it was just strange to me, you know? So the next day, I go out, and I'm, like, looking for wires. I'm looking for a light. I'm thinking, you know, whatever that was, there has to be a logical explanation Again, I have a degree in criminal investigation, so I am naturally curious. And if you're going to fool me, I'm going to try to figure it out. So I go out there and I look, nothing. Did find two footprints the next day, which were pretty cool. Neither of them were very large. Uh, one was kind of interesting because it was a fence that went right up to where there was some water. Uh, they'd had some flooding. And the water had risen up to this fence. And it, it was one single footprint, which was also odd but as if it stepped over the fence, took a step, then left a footprint, and then just disappeared. But it was coming from the water, which is kind of odd. So you think that's odd or crazy. That's not even the craziest thing to happen that night. <laughs> so we're standing there, and again, I'm standing here. Actually, Jonathan was over here this time. Sarah was to my left. And I remember that very well because I still have fingernail claw marks on my arm where she grabbed me. And from our left, something just started barreling through the, through the trees. I mean, there were branches cracking, breaking, and I, I can't even begin to describe what I heard. And I won't even attempt to try to mimic it. But it, when, when this happened, Jonathan had a handgun. He turns with his gun. Sarah and I both had flashlights. We turned the flashlight. I mean, like, instant. And there was nothing there. I 100% believed that when I got the flashlight over there, I was going to see an elk. That's what I thought was coming through the trees. And there was nothing there. Can't explain it. You know, there's no logical explanation. But it was... A very, very fun trip. It was only one day, one night technically, and then the next day we kind of went out. We found the footprints. We did find some um, pretty interesting uh, trails, I guess, on their property that they weren't aware of, which was kind of cool. So we, we had a good time. 
So the evidence that was collected or observed there were, we heard the heavy footfall, we found the footprints the next day, we have a strange light in the woods that I still can't explain, and what I call a bluff charge from the darkness. Now, I, I will tell you that I have now experienced that twice. Uh, that was the first one. It was, it, was like a, it was like a porch light. It was just like a white light. You know, there wasn't, a, and that's a great question. It wasn't like this bluish or reddish glow. Thick. It was like a light came on, but it was condensed. I, I, I don't even know if there's any other better way of saying it. It was just a condensed light that you could see it, and it did light up the area, but it wasn't, it didn't light up like you would expect a light to do, you know? So... Great question. So then we have the bluff charge. So, so now I still believe that Bigfoot's flesh and blood, but this time we had some pretty strange occurrences to go with that previous sighting, with their previous sighting, uh, which is the picture I showed you there. Now I'm a little more confused, right? So this is kind of the time I start learning, you know, I gotta be open-minded. Because I, I'm not going to lie to you, when I was, uh, first got into this, I hear people talk about zapping and mind speaking and cloaking and all these things. I thought, man, you know, these, these, <laughs> well, these guys are seeing something that I just, I just can't, I can't buy, you know. Now I'm seeing them. Now I'm the salesman. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's tough. <laughs> it's hard to go through that. So then we go to Alabama. Now, Alabama was an interesting trip. It was, um, we didn't have the, the usual physical evidence uh, from the trip, which was, which was kind of disappointing, but it happened. You know, when I'd been out, gosh, 150 times I've been out bigfooting, I guess, and uh, I've probably only had experiences 10 times. I've only, think I saw something once, <laughs> you know, so, it happens, you know, you go out and you don't find any evidence, but we did have a couple really cool experiences while we were there. And this is kind of an idea of where we were in Tuscaloosa. I didn't take these pictures. I actually stole these off Google, don't tell on me. And, uh, but I thought it was, it's very pretty and it really tells kind of where we were and what we were in, you know. So it's important to say when, when, when we go out, we, you know, we don't go out in our backyard and you know, have a seat, you know, we, we go out pretty deep in the woods. Right, Ryan? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> Just make sure he's awake over there. So, <clears throat> we did find some hair, which was the only physical evidence that we caught, that we found. And, <laughs> and, and remember the story a minute ago where I, I had a camera, but I didn't take a picture, you know, and it's like, boom, why didn't I take a picture? Well, I'm going to kind of tell the story in order, so I'm going to do the roll call first, but this uh, roll call was, I call it the roll call incident. So there's five of us out there. There's, um, there's this little lady named Denise. She's like 60 years old, and she is a Sherman tank. I don't care what you put in front of her. She was going through it. She's going to do it, whether you like it or not. Then it was Ashley. There was Adam Davies, myself and a friend of ours named Jason. So we're standing out on this, on this road. It's a, and I say road, but it, there's never any traffic. It's, it's the house, the, the people we were th at their property, it's their road. And it's like a family area. All that property is owned by them and their family. And so they're the only ones that really use it, which is kind of cool. So we're standing there and we hear something kind of in the woods to our left. Now at this point, we're probably 350 yards probably from the edge of her actual yard, and that's probably another 100 yards to her house. So we're out there pretty far down the road at this point. And Denise says, I see something moving. So she's gone, right in the woods. And I'm like, what the heck just happened? You know, she's like this tall. And I might, and I might be giving her credit. She might be this tall, you know? So Jason says, okay, I'll go with her. So we're like, okay, cool. So Jason goes in with her. So now there's three of us out there. Then Ashley says, I just saw what looked like moonlight reflecting off hair. 
So Ashley goes in. I look at Adam and we kind of flip a coin. I lost. I had to go in with her. So I go in. I'm kidding. We didn't really flip a coin. So I, I go in with her and, and we're in the woods and we're like, you know, with flashlights, we're down on our hands and knees looking underneath the trees, seeing if we can see feet, anything, you know. Never saw anything. We're in there for probably a good 10, 15 minutes. We come back on the road and everybody's gone. And I'm like, well, where'd everybody go? You know? So um, we heard real heavy movement, probably not 30 yards from us in the woods, just right there. And I said, well, that's probably Denise and Jason. So I'm going to find out. So I yell roll call real loud, and I get a response. I hear, and this is the only disagreement, by the way, the whole thing was I thought I heard, um, yeah, and she thought she heard, um, like, okay, or something along those lines, right? That's the only dis discrepancy in, our, in anybody's story. So I yell roll call. I get a, you know, yeah, return, response, and I'm like, okay, well, there's Jason. Ashley, or she says, well, I see a light down the road. So I look on and I see a light and I'm like, okay, well that, Jason and Denise are right there. Adam's by himself. We should probably go down with Adam. So we start going down the road. Light starts getting closer. <laughs> it's Denise. We're like, hey man, where is, is Adam down there? She goes, yeah, they both are. And of course, right away, we look at each other like, well, what in the heck just responded to me? You know? So the recorder that Jason had is, is this masterpiece. I mean, I love this recorder. He actually had it. It's something he put together, and I asked him for the schematics for it so I can build one someday because <laughs> it's like a little rocket or something. But it's this box. It's got a car batteries in there, and it's got this real long pipe, and the, and the mic is way up in the air. And it's, and it, you know, the only bad thing about it is it records 360 degrees, right? Turns out that was actually a good thing because on this recording, you're going to hear me say roll call. You might very faintly hear the response, but then there's something happens that none of us heard. So we surmise that it had to come from the other side of the recorder. Okay. So let's see how this works. I'm not a techie guy. And do you guys hear the whoop? We didn't hear that that night. It wasn't until after that, after that happened. And by the way, these, this is like the first time I've ever shared any of this, by the way. Just so you guys know, you guys are the first people to ever see this or hear this. So that's so it's kind of cool. So I, um, I was pretty excited because I'm like, you know, well, Jason's recorder had to pick that up, you know. So I run back and I got the headset on. I'm listening to the recording. And then I catch that and I hear the whoop and I'm going... Well, we didn't hear that. So there was an obvious whoop that came that probably heard me yell roll call, got the response, and then it on the other side of the recorder must have whooped because we didn't hear it. So that was pretty cool. We were there for about four nights, I think four or five nights. I don't remember. I don't see Claudia anywhere. Is she here? Okay. But uh, we were there about three or four nights, and it was a couple nights later. We're sitting out by the fireplace, and we're just kind of having fun, you know, relaxing. It's like 1 o'clock in the morning, and we get this. Now, you will hear coyotes, by the way. It's, you'll know the difference. Amen. Okay, that's not the audio I'm supposed to be there. <laughs> I, I did, for, uh, for sure, I did say a second ago, I am not a techie guy. Is that the same one? But it wasn't in my practice. <laughs> okay, well then, I can either look for it real quick if you want to hear it. You want to hear it? Okay, let me find it real quick. I'm, I apologize, you guys. Uh, Wolf? Oh, he's, he's not here. Okay, because I don't even know how to get out. Let's see if I can. <laughs> Do you guys realize how embarrassing this is, by the way? <laughs> Notice the glowing red you see now? That's not what was in the woods that night, right? So, so there's, there's these coyotes going off in a the distance. 
And all of a sudden we hear, is anyone familiar with the Ohio howl sound? Okay. It was very similar like that, but it was three very long, loud, there was like three of them. And it was, uh, I'm so disappointed. Now, in fairness, the last one did kind of have a coyote-type sound to it. So could they have been coyotes? Maybe. But it pretty well freaked us out, and we were all like, you know. So we, uh, we went out and checked it out and, and had a little, you know, night investigation. Never, never found anything. Again, we didn't see any footprints or anything else. The hair, that was pretty cool. The, uh, the night... The roll call incident happened. The next day, we decided we were going to go back out to the same area where we heard things moving around. And we, you know, and in my opinion, when if anything is anywhere, it leaves some physical evidence. So you're going to find something to show it was there, you know. So we go back out there and we're looking around, and in a crook of a tree about this high, there was like a little branch with like this little bend in it. And it was a tuft of hair. Now, it was odd because it looked more like um, deer than it did Bigfoot. It wasn't long hair. It wasn't, you know, black. It wasn't thick, you know, wiry. It just looked like deer hair, but a little bit longer than deer hair. So we, we had quite the conversation about it. Um, Jason took it, took it home with him. to uh, He had a, a nice little kind of lab at his house so he could check it out and investigate it and see what it was. After about a month, I was like, you know, I want to get somebody to really look at this, you know. So I call up a friend of mine in Washington. She says, hey, I'll look at it for free. I'll tell you what it is. I was like, great. So I call Jason. I'm like, hey, Jason, I need that hair. Can you mail it? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'll mail it to you. So he mails it to me. I get the envelope in the mail, and there's these little teeth marks on one corner, a rodent had eaten the hair out of the envelope. So, again, what is that? What's that called? Newton's Law? Is that what they say? Is that, or what? Murphy's, Murphy's Law. Yeah, Murphy's Law. Yeah, Murphy's. So, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, I wonder why that didn't say that. Why it didn't, why it did the roll call a second ago? It's like, I'm so confused. So that was pretty cool. But we did get hair. We just didn't keep hair. So this time there was no physical evidence in the way of footprints, but finding the hair and getting a res uh, response leads me to believe that these are probably more intelligent than I thought. And I thought they were smart already, so that gives them a lot of credit. I'm not as confused now and still thinking flesh and blood. The evidence is leading me towards there being more than one kind of experience, Bigfoot and paranormal. So at this point, in my mind, you have, I'm experiencing Bigfoot activity and some paranormal activity. And I, and I, and I try to rationalize this. I'm trying to think, why would, a, why would there be both in one spot? Well, I just said, I think they're pretty smart. So if they see an orb or something in the woods, wouldn't they want to go check it out too? So why would it be so strange to think that you would find a Bigfoot in the same place that you may have a paranormal experience? Okay, because they're curious too. That's what, I, that's what I believe. Okay, so then we're going to go to Oregon. Now, this was one of my favorite places I've ever been. This is, uh, I've been there so many times. We've probably been there uh, 10 times, I guess. Um, one time we went out there for 10 days. And one night, Dan, who my, my buddy, he lives about 45 minutes away from where we go, and he decided he'd had enough. He was going to go home and take a shower. So one night I spent out there by myself, which was kind of cool, you know, scary. 
It is scary. <laughs> I'm six foot, 230 pounds, and I, I ain't going to lie. It was scary. So you're out there, and you, and you hear these things, you know, you, in your mind, especially when you're by yourself, your mind likes to race and play tricks on you, you know, and, and it's, uh, it makes it actually a little more fun. But I, but I will, I'll be honest, I spent a lot of time in the van because the mosquitoes at that time were horrible, horrible. I mean, you see, my van is a white van, and when I got in the van, it became black because all the mosquitoes landed on it. So it was, it, it was pretty bad. But it was, it was, we still had a great time. So there's a lot of things that's happened out there, and I just, I'm just going to kind of go through some of the pictures. And these are some of our pictures of where we go. And I, and I mentioned Bob Gimlin a little while ago, and I, I had mentioned that he came out with us one time, which was pretty cool. So that is Mr. Bob Gimlin right there. He came out with us, and we... Uh, we had a good time. He's 80, he, at the time, he was 84 years old, and he's out walking through the woods helping us put up trail cams. How cool is that, you know, to get to hang out with Bob? So there's so many things I can talk about that Steve would say I'd have to come back. Steve, can I come back? <laughs> so I just put a few things in here just to kind of touch on, which I, I thought was pretty cool. This is the first one. And you guys see that tree right there that I got that red circle around? <coughs> Do you see anything behind that tree or anything? No? Let me explain, before I go to this next slide, by the way, let me explain how a FLIR works. FLIR is forward-looking infrared. Um, what is, yeah, that's it. Forward-looking infrared. It doesn't take video like a regular camera does, it registers heat, okay? The hottest object in the video will be the whitest, depending on the polarity you have it on or whatever that term is. Again, I'm not tech savvy. So, so this next one, see if you see anything there now. Anybody see anything there now? <laughs> this one is actually a video I can get it to play, where is it at? Let's see. There we go. So I took this on the FLIR that, that night, and man, we were really excited. This was uh, probably 75, 85 feet from our camp. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Now, whatever that is, I sent that to some experts. I sent, I sent it to uh, Cliff Berrickman from Finding Bigfoot. He's a friend of mine. And he says it was 100% definitely a mammal. He said that the, the heat is all the same throughout the entire body. 100% a mammal. I sent it to Jeff Meldrum. Jeff said, I don't see what you're looking at. I'm like, the spot right there behind the tree. What spot? He's like circling things that are way away from it going like this. I'm like, no, Jeff, right there. Um, I sent it to Derek Randalls. He said, no, I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's an animal. You know? uh, I sent it to a buddy of mine in Kentucky. He said, definitely an animal. So how confusing is that? You know, Cliff and Michael tell you it's, it's an animal. Dr. Meldrum and, and uh, um, my other buddy said, it, well, Jeff can't even find it, I'm, which kind of confused me. So Dan and I decided we're going to go back out and we're going to do a recreation. So I take the same FLIR, I stand in the exact same spot, and it's not there, which is why we have that photo. This photo was actually from the recreation. So we get all excited. Dan goes over there and he stands there. I got video of him standing there with nothing there. We're all excited. We, we were like, we got a video of Bigfoot. We got everything done, and I decided, I'm just going to try something. I move seven feet to my right and stick the camera up and boom, it's back. Turns out that just happened to be some light uh, heat anomaly behind the trees and some opening between the woods that you can only see from that angle. So that's pretty disappointing. But you know what? You, you, you learn from failure too. You know? We were pretty excited. I mean, I'm sending this off to some pretty big name people. You know, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, who's a professor of anthropology in Idaho State University. You know, he's, 
he's way up there in, in the field of Bigfoot research. Cliff Bergman, the guy from Finding Bigfoot, I mean, I'm sending this off to some really good people and I'm feeling pretty good about it. And it turns out to be nothing. And the reason I put this in is because I, I want to show you that not everything is what you think and you have to go back and look at it again. Because if you, if, you can't, if you can't recreate it, then maybe you have something. If you can recreate it, then at least you know. You know? So we never released that film for obvious reasons. And uh, most of the people who have seen it have all said, you know, congratulations. It just tells me that you're an honest guy. Because <laughs> you know? we could have released that and said, look what we got. And it could have been one of the best videos ever out there. And people would have believed it. I think, anyway. Because I still see it. Everybody but Jeff Meldrum, he would have said, I still don't see it. Um, oh, yeah, this, is, this was a trail cam that we set out. And, I, and, I, and this is one of those things that I don't know what it is. And if anybody here has an idea, please raise your hand and tell me, because I'm definitely open to suggestions. Let's see if I can figure out what it is. It's very short, and it happens very, very quickly. We set these trail cams out for three months, and this camera picked that up after it was out there for about three weeks, I believe it was, three or four weeks, and this was at like eight o'clock at night. Uh, it's in an area that nobody goes to. You know, this isn't, we, when we go out here, and it's very important I point this out, we don't walk the trails, you know. We go deep in the woods. We had these, we wanted to set these trail cams up. I actually got a, uh, on another one, I don't have it on here, but I actually got a mountain lion. So that tells you how remote it is. Mountain lions are very elusive. They're really hard to get, and we're very proud of that, that picture. And I probably should have put it in just for fun, but. So I'm gonna play it one more time. Anybody have any clue as to what that might be? On the right side of the screen, very quickly. No clue. Bird? It's a very good question. It's about this high. The camera was set about he uh, head level. So the camera, the lens is about my eye level. So great question. Anchor to a tree. It was anchored to a tree. And as a matter of fact, and that's an interesting thing, because on this particular tree, there was two trees about this far apart. This one was on this tree facing in that direction. And there was, we also had one on this tree facing in that direction. This trail camera, for some ungodly reason, just got, when it's supposed to take a 10 second video, uh, it ended up getting 90 minutes of static. Don't know what happened to it, no clue, and it has never worked since. So one of the trail cams, the other trail cam, of course, is now damaged, and we have no idea what caused that. So I did take some little stills of this to kind of maybe see if anybody, looks. so we got that, then that, then that. So it's pretty, it was an, just an interesting find that we got on trail cam after sitting out there for three months. So that would have been June, July. That would probably would have been right about this time. So. so then we have this picture. This is probably the best example of, take, of somebody going out and taking a comparison shot that I've ever seen. Uh, my buddy, Dan, Dan Lindholm, uh, great Greg, he's my brother from another mother, love him to death. He and I go out there all the time. And this is his comparison shot of something he saw. And I put this first because it's very important. Does everybody see that vine coming down the side of that tree? There's like a vine coming straight down about this far from the tree. And it's perfectly straight, right? Well, this is why he took another picture there. And look at that vine now. It comes down and it turns right towards the tree. No clue what it is, there's no detail, but it's not far-fetched to believe that there was a Bigfoot there. Um, and again, the comparison shot, it's, it's perfect. Uh, it is the same time of day. I think one day was a little cloudier than the other, but it didn't make any difference. But the vine, to me, is the telling part. Because on one, it goes straight down, and the day before, or the week before, it came down and it bent up to the tree. So something was there, and it had the vine pushed against the tree. So that was pretty cool. So, 
There was another night, and, I, and I, I'm only mentioning these because it's on my notes on the next slide, so I want to go ahead and get that out before we go in there. Um, I, I had mentioned that I had had a bluff charge twice now, and the second time was in this area. Uh, we had gone out. Uh, we, I thought I saw something on FLIR. I gave the FLIR to another guy, and I said, just keep the FLIR on it. I'm going to go move towards it. My hope was that whatever it was would move, and we would get it moving, and we'd have a pretty good video of it. Unfortunately, the video, the guy with the camera wasn't even looking at me, and I don't know why, but he wasn't. So, so we ended up getting pretty much nothing on it either. But I'm in this area, and it was an interesting situation. And this kind of goes back to that, I, I don't know what it was. Because as I, as I get to this area, there's, an, there's a little clearing, and it's not very big. It's only, you know, probably about from me to Ryan over here, a s circle. But when I stepped in it, something whistled at me. Now, I don't have any weapons. I never carry a weapon in the woods. I have no flashlight with me. I have absolutely nothing. In my mind, I'm being watched from over here with the FLIR, so I'm, I'm safe because they can see me. Nope. So I take a step, I hear a whistle. I step back, I got my walkie-talkie, and I go, okay, guys, something just whistled at me. So I like, uh -uh. try again. I take a step, it whistles, I step back. Every time I put my foot in that circle, something Sounded like right in front of me. And I cannot whistle, so I won't try to imitate it, but it was just this whistle, like a bird, you know? After this happened, probably four or five times, I told him, I said, look, I'm not going to stop this time. I'm on my walkie-talkie. I said, I'm not going to stop this time. I'm going on in. They're like, all right, just be careful. It's all right. So I take a step. I hear the whistle. I keep walking. The whistle stops. I get this really, really uneasy feeling. You ever like sit at a restaurant or something, you know somebody's watching you and you kind of get that and you turn around and you hear somebody, you know, it was that same feeling. Somebody or something was watching me and I knew it, I can't prove it, but I knew it. And all of a sudden, the exact same thing that happened in Washington happened again. Something just comes crashing through the woods again to my left. Again, I have nothing. I don't have a flashlight. I don't have a gun. I have nothing. And all I could do was turn and, and prepare to die. <laughs> you know? and, and again, I'm expect this time actually I thought it was a bear, um, but nothing ever came out of the woods. Nothing was caught on flare. Nothing was, just makes no sense. You know, How, what is whistling at me in the middle of this circle, but when I step in there, it, it's gone. And then I'm in there, and then something comes and tries to run me out. Makes no sense. <clears throat> um, another night we were out there, and I'll make this one quick. I know I'm probably, everybody be home by four, I promise. Okay? <laughs> so we're sitting out there in, in two different directions, and this is so wild. It was like about a mile away in that direction and about a mile away in that direction from our camp. We hear... The only thing I can describe it is, is two Bigfoot arguing. That's all I can tell you. Because over here you hear this. <laughs> then over here. <laughs> and it goes back and forth like for 20 minutes. We got recorders out. And I'm like, we got this on recording. This is awesome because it's loud. We can hear it so good. Nothing on the recorder. <laughs> Explain it. I can't. So, uh. So we did have that. Uh, Dan had a tree thrown at him one time, a, about a 40-foot uh, tree. And Ryan, you met Dan. Did, does Dan seem to type to lie about that? Yeah. Yeah, he was... Uh, a tree just came at him like, a, like an arrow. It wasn't like fell. It came shot at him. Um, his, uh, his son-in-law, or stepson, saw the tree in the air and actually got out of the way. So, and again, now this wasn't like a big... You know, pine tree with all the bristles. This was just a basically a log, you know, but it was still, I mean, what could have done that, you know? Dan found a tree. I kid you not. This tree is this big around, right? This tree is this big around. It's completely no bark on it, just a smooth tree. And it, it was set up. It's so long, I can't even tell you how big it was because the top of it is hidden inside the other tree, 
but it is set up next to another tree and just sitting there. It didn't fall off. There's no divot where it would have come from the other tree and down. The other tree isn't shaved off at the top. It's just as tall as all the other ones. If this tree had been up there, it would have been twice as big. No idea where it came from, how it got there, no clue. But there's this giant tree set up next to another tree. So this, I mean, I could go on and on about things because we've been there so many times. We've had so many cool things. Um, but it was, it's a great, great place. And uh, definitely can't wait to get out there again. So this time we got the bluff charge. We've heard the Bigfoot arguing. Uh, Dan had a tree throw at him. Uh, paranormal experiences, you know, with the whistling. and Because I just don't know what it was. Birds don't go out at night. Could have been a squirrel or a chipmunk, I guess. But it was timed perfect where every time I took a step, it did it. And uh, we did see some lights in the sky one night, by the way. Uh, they were coming a nice spin. I put that in there because it's really cool. Possible UFO sightings. There were these lights, and they were really high. And they were coming across the sky, and we tried to film it, but we couldn't get anything on film. It was just black. You know, our, our cameras weren't good enough to pick up the, you know, the slides. But it was kind of moving, and it would slow down and move, and then slow down and move, and then sometimes it would go back and forth. And we're, we're sitting there arguing between ourselves, like, maybe we're doing this, you know? Maybe we're just not balanced. You know, we're, we try to rationalize it, but, you know, it, it's, but we saw it. So now I don't know what to think. My experiences are being, um, are beginning to cloud my judgment. I'm seeing flesh and blood evidence, but the paranormal aspect is becoming much more prevalent. And I have to remind myself that I don't care what the truth is, I just want the truth, right? And I think that's, think about that. It's so, so important. You can't be concerned about what the truth is, you just have to want the truth. If Bigfoot can cloak and disappear or mind speak and talk to you through your mind or, or zap you or all these other things, I'm okay with it, but let me see it, <laughs> you know? So, so I don't know what to think. <clears throat> so this next trip was amazing. And, uh, the experiences we had as a group covers, definitely covers different genres and more than, and more than once. Um, now my entire belief system gets challenged because now we're gonna go to Florida. We're gonna go to Chattahoochee, Florida. And uh, Ryan, who is here by the way, was, was with us on this trip. So uh, Ryan, if I say anything that isn't true or anything else, you, you feel free to heckle me, okay? All right. Um, this is an interesting area. Uh, let me kind of, there is a, a lake and that's, that little pond right there is called Ochizi Pond. And I think it was back in the 40s or 30s. What, what, do you remember the time frame? Not exactly. The, the, uh, of the Ochizi wild man. So uh, I think it was, I'm not going to say anything because I don't really know. If I do, I'm just guessing, so I don't want to. I don't want to do that. But I can tell you that there were newspaper clippings of a of a wild man that was captured there. So they find this animal, man, six feet tall, very thin, covered in hair from its head to its feet, um, spoke no English. Turns out there just happened to have been a uh, mental hospital not far from there. So they just said. They, they literally took it, by the way, they chained it up and took it to the governor's house. And the governor said, well, it must just be someone escaped from the mental hospital. Take it back there. So they took it back there. They kept it there for, I think it was three or four years, and it actually died there. And the story is that it was buried there. So it uh, turns out a friend of ours who works has an office in that complex, and he didn't know where it was, but he, said, he, he thought he knew where it was. And if it was true, it's underneath a building at this point. No one can find it anyway. So, uh, so it's pretty cool. So this area has a history going into it. Um, so first we're going to talk about a couple different paranormal things that happened while we were there. Okay. And uh, this was one of my favorites. And Ryan is talking, we're doing these interviews, we're, we're working on a documentary. Ryan was gracious enough to be in the documentary. And at the end, I wanted to interview everybody. And this was Ryan's end of his interview, and I just want you to listen close after he's done talking. <laughs> 
and it's pretty quick after he's done. This place is wild, and it is hot, and it is nonstop. Do you guys hear that? You want to hear it again? Me too. This place is wild, and it is hot, and it is nonstop. Yeah, this is in the same, yeah, the same area, yeah. Is that public or private? It is government land. Uh, that land is actually owned by the state of Florida. Uh, that complex is um, uh, my, our buddy who, who lives in that area, the one who uh, we went to his house. Uh, he, is a, he is an architect for the state of Florida, and he has a satellite office in that complex. So everything in there is owned by the state of Florida. So we're not allowed in to do investigations and there is actually I believe that part of the hospital is still in operation today so uh, they have a lot of rules about filming on the property and things like that um, now we did find that if you drive slow enough and you hold your camera just right no one would notice as you drove through and it works out pretty well so we'll just say that <laughs> so yeah so that was pretty cool so Ryan has uh, you know Ryan didn't, we didn't even hear that at the time right Yeah, and, 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 and there, there was a room that was close and there were people in there talking, but I don't think anybody was moaning. So whatever it was, I, I don't know, but it, did, but it was a cool find. <laughs> Again, Ryan, is, uh, he's asleep in his room, and in the middle of the night, we hear this. Now, again, we, we, we talked about it. We talked to the homeowners. None of them did it. Uh, the other guy who was staying in the house that night, he says he didn't do it. Nobody did it, and you know Brian is asleep, and I think he accidentally caught this, by the way. I don't think he even meant to turn his recorder on, but uh, right as soon as this is done, you hear him kind of move around in the bed. So you know he's, it's not him, because he, he's like, you know, so you'll know. So... Whatever it was that opened that door or made whatever that was creaked, that was just pretty cool. And it was another cool find for the ghost stuff, you know? And uh, so that was fun. And actually, Ryan was kind of our paranormal guy. So all this paranormal stuff was kind of be revolved around Ryan. So I'll quit picking on him here a little bit. But um, So this one was kind of interesting as well because uh, he asked the question and he gets an answer. And to me, it sounds like it says, you set it up, okay? So this was, I believe, on a spirit box. How did I get here? You set it up. I just set it up. So he understood it at the time because he even responded to it. I set it up, you know. So uh, let's listen to that again because that was pretty cool. How did I get here? You set it up. I just set it up. And just so you know, those spirit boxes, by the way, while yes, they do manufacture words at random times, just based on whatever frequency it's picking up at the moment, because it kind of goes through all these different frequencies, very rarely will you get a sentence that's an accident. If you get a sentence, I believe that it's, it's meant for you to hear the sentence. So, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then this one happened. Tell me uh, anything you want to tell me right off the bat. Now, to me, it sounds like it responds, I'm in you. So Ryan said he wished he had known that. He would have gotten her out. <laughs> but uh, so that was, so that was pretty cool. So we had, some, we had some paranormal stuff go on. And I, I had another audio that I, I was unable to find. And uh, I, wanted to, I really, really wanted to put it on here. Um, we were th on this property and there's an adjacent property that is owned by, I believe, family members, if I'm not mistaken. And we did a nighttime and paranormal investigation in that house. Well, at one point, Ryan says, let's go outside. So 
We go outside and I notice that I was the last one out and I noticed that he left his bag in the middle of the living room floor of this old decrepit house and I wish I had pictures of the house because you guys would be like, you can't leave anything in there, Ryan. What's wrong with you? you know? So I took the recorder and I set it down on top of his bag and I left it there and I didn't catch it until I got home and I was listening to it and I was dumbfounded because there's nobody in the house, nobody's even around the house because by this point, and you're going to hear about this in a minute, Something really cool would happen, and everybody was away from the house. Um, and then on the recorder, you hear this, go outside. It was a crazy. You know, it was, there was a knock, and then a voice said, go outside. And there was nobody there. 100% guarantee you nobody was there, because I could account for everybody who was there as being outside because of what was happening outside. Something really cool, and I'm going to go through that in a minute because that was probably my favorite ever experience in Bigfooting was in that next, here in a minute. So, so that was pretty cool. And then I got just Ryan's experience because unfortunately Ryan had a, um, a traumatic experience while he was there, and, uh, it, and, and it's rightfully so. You know, we unfortunately, we weren't able to get it on audio or video, but believe me, it happened, right? Um, <laughs> the first few nights, Ryan and I slept in what was called the Sugar Shack, which was the most, number one, it is the most active place on the property according to the property owners. And uh, it, was, um, it was interesting. To, uh, so we, we're up at the house, it's late at night, we come back down, Ryan had already decided that night he was going to stay in the house because some of their other guests had left, there was now a room open, and Ryan, of course, says, like, hey, I'll take it, <laughs> you know, and I don't blame him, although he left me there by myself again, people, why is everybody leaving me <laughs> in these scary places? So we walk down to the house, we walk down to the sugar shack, he gets a few things, and the door on the sugar shack is real tough to close. It drags across the porch. And it's like that because you have to kind of pick it up and pull it in because they don't want snakes climbing underneath the door. So they do it on purpose, okay? So when I say this is a freaky place, it's really a freaky place. So Ryan comes in, gets a few things. He's not there a minute, maybe. And he turns around, and he walks out, and I, I go over to close the door, and I tell him, I say, you know, be careful. He's all right. Now, he's only got about a... 50 yard, 75 yard walk up to the house probably. So I close the door. <laughs> I get a phone call. I hear, by the way, just a few seconds after he leaves, I hear a car horn. To me, it's not like a car horn. And in my mind, he had just taken out his keys, locked his car, put his keys back in his pocket, and in turn walked up the house. As soon as it happened, I forgot about it. It's about 15 minutes later, my cell phone rings. Why is Ryan calling, you know? So I, hello, and he says, uh, he goes, hey, man, something just screamed at me. I'm like, what, what do you mean? I was, now at the time, I'm thinking, you know, oh yeah, I'm glad you had an experience, you know? And he goes, no, no, when I left there, he goes, I only got about 15 feet away from the door and something screamed at me. And the next day when we're looking at his footprints, we know that something scared him. The evidence was there. The footprints went, suddenly there was a turn, a very quick turn in his footprints, and then they were very far apart, which means he was hauling tail, okay? So while the researcher side of me says, man, I'm, I'm so glad Ryan had that experience. The friend side of me is like, man, dude, I'm so sorry that you experienced that, you know, because it, it bothered him. <clears throat> so Ryan and I have talked pretty extensively about it, and we, you know, we kind of go over it, and, and he believes that a Bigfoot had screamed at him. And uh, I, don't, I don't think so. I've never heard that noise that he, that he describes. I've never had anyone tell me that noise except for something else. How did I get here? And actually in here in just a second, this is actually video of the trail cam that was set outside the sugar shack. You can see the light on inside the sugar shack. 
And uh, let's see, here we go. So this is us coming up that night. I have no idea what those lights are on me, by the way. I, I guess I had something reflective on my shirt, I guess, because that's IR light. So that's us going to the sugar shack. I don't think you've seen these, have you, Ryan? No. No. Then, this is after he left. Now, the, the camera never showed him actually leaving, but if you watch, the far side over by the light on that other side window, if you watch that, you will see a light flicker on the side of the building, which I believe is while Ryan is running, the camera in his hand, and he's running, and that light is flickering against the side, but nothing, we don't get anything. So if you saw that light, it's very faint, but, it, but if you saw that, I believe that was Ryan's flashlight while he was running. Um, that's what I believe, screamed at Ryan. That's called the rake. It has been spotted on the property. Um, when the homeowner, Carolyn, called me up and she said, you know, we saw a, we had a Bigfoot sighting the other day. And I said, you did? And she goes, I said, tell me about it. She said, well, it was acting kind of weird because it was walking around on all fours. And she goes, it didn't have any hair. And I'm like, wait, what do you mean it didn't have any hair? She goes, yeah, it had like dry skin. You know, it was, it was odd. So I sent her the picture of the rake. She looked at it. She goes, yeah, that's it. And I said, well, Carolyn, that's not a Bigfoot. That's a rake. And uh, the, no one knows what they are. They just started being seen back in 2006, I think was the first sighting. Um, but they're, in my opinion, some kind of demon. I, I don't know what they are. But the fact that she had seen one of these before that happened and the experience that he had, um, the, the, the audio, the sound that he said he heard didn't match anything that I've ever heard from a Bigfoot or heard about a Bigfoot leads me to believe that this is probably what that was. I know that probably doesn't make you feel any better, but that's what I think it was. So I had mentioned a second ago, and I'm almost done, by the way. I'm probably, I don't know how long I've been up here. Uh, I've been counting how many times somebody does this. <laughs> I'm still on zero, by the way. I haven't seen it yet. So I had mentioned that something really, really cool happened, and while we were outside that, the old, I call it the haunted house, they call it an old cabin. Um, so we go outside. Ryan, and I had mentioned that he had said, let's go outside. So him and Dan Lindholm and, and the cameraman, they went around to the other side of the building, and I'd gone, and now one of the rules about going out there was we had to have armed security, so my beautiful girlfriend there, Claudia, a friend of hers is a um, SWAT uh, instructor up in Northern California. So we talked to him and a couple of his buddies into flying out and they came out as our armed security. So we had very well-trained army type guys watching us. And uh, so I'm out there at the car with them guys. I'm standing outside. We're actually watching comedians on YouTube, not named Ryan Singer. And uh, we <laughs> so... All of a sudden, they start saying, hey, guys, guys, we need you over here. We need you over here. So we, I'm like, you know, get your, get your stuff. Come on, let's go, let's go. So we start going around. Turns out it was a false alarm. It's not what they thought they saw when they called us. But as we came around the house, Dan Lindholm, who was another guy that there, he said he heard something stand up in the, in the bushes and run in the opposite direction. So we're like, cool, let's get the flares out. So Dan Butler gets his flare out, and this is what we get. Just looks like a little dot right there in the middle, right? Well, I can tell you that little dot wasn't there before, then it was, and then it wasn't. So whatever it was, when we first made the scan, wasn't there. When we came back, it was there. And when we went to take another picture later, it was gone. So as I mentioned, I've got a, kind of a curious mind, so I've got to zoom into this thing. I don't know how well it's going to look, but I zoom in, and, I, and again, this whole thing is about keeping an open mind, because we're going through so many different things, <laughs> and it's really hard to tell up there. We actually had an artist draw over top of the picture of what we see. Looking at it on my computer, it looks really good. Looking at it on the wall, I can see it, but it's tough, okay? So... 
when you take the picture out, that's what you get. That's what you're left with. So that is what is sitting on top of a hill looking over. And it was sitting like this, leaning over, watching this. It had gotten up, run away from Dan, gone down the hill, turned, and came up the other side, thinking we couldn't see it, and was sitting there watching us. So we got it with Fleer. Now, Dan Butler, who was one of our security guys, had the Fleer out, and he was looking down the road, and he saw something on all fours come out in the middle of the road and stand there with the Fleer. When he went to take a picture, what is it called? Something law? Murphy. Murphy's law. The camera died. Battery did. <laughs> so he goes and gets a new battery, comes back, and it's gone. But that was pretty cool, you know? So we had, at one particular moment, we have a probable Bigfoot get up and run away because it's probably right up by the house watching us through the windows as our little lights are shining around because this house is very, very decrepit. This house is falling apart. In fact, I told these guys a couple times, don't stand too close together. We don't want to fall through the floor. You know, stand apart. So we, uh, so we have that happen. We get the, the you know, go outside. On audio, we get all these crazy things. It's really cool. And then, what do I wonder? We find this. I'm just going to play this little video for you. It's not very long, but this is, this is really cool. I know Bigfoots are, are notorious for making what they call an X marker, okay? And this one is huge. I listened for it for bad words. I don't think there are any. Give you a little scale. Nature doesn't Back that do that way. That's Bill and Carolyn's place. I can't get too close because it's these things are 50 feet long. Each tree was about 40 to 50 light. feet We're long our light. and put up in a perfect X. The bottom left side was off the ground. The, the one going from the top left to the bottom right um, was upside down. So that was a pretty cool find. <laughs> I, I, I've never seen anything in nature quite like it. I've never seen nature duplicate that. Now, in fairness, about a year or so earlier, there was a hurricane that went through. Uh, it was a pretty bad hurricane, but um, <laughs> that's just, I don't think that's what it was. I, I personally believe that a Bigfoot put that there and basically because we didn't see it the day before, doesn't mean it wasn't there, but we didn't see it the day before. So I believe that it was put there intentionally, probably the day before, the day before that, saying, don't come past here. This is, this is, this is where you stop. What's the location again? This is uh, in Chattahoochee, Florida. Florida. Yes. So that was pretty cool. You know, that's a very good question. They were wedged in and moved and uh if you if you see some of the other video where i where we have some really close shots of that uh you can actually see where the bark is is rubbed off where it was put in and moved into place uh rather if if, if it had landed there and just slid there somehow by some miraculous reason uh there would have been a scuff mark all the way up the tree and that wasn't the case the scuff marks were only about that long so it was like they were put in placed in 
And those branches right around there almost seemed to be intertwined with it like it was using it to tie it in. Because again, the, the, the bottom left side is actually about this high off the ground. It's just balanced there. The top left side is the bottom of the other, the other piece. So it's upside down. There's no way we could have done that, even with those security guys with us. It, we, we just couldn't. It just wouldn't, wasn't going to happen. So how we didn't see that the day before was beyond me, so I'm assuming it happened that night. Now, we did hear, I don't know if, I don't know if that was the night or not, but I don't think I even got that other part in here. But, um, so now my views are completely different than what they were when I started researching. When I started reaching, researching the unexplained. Having an open mind is taking me closer to the answers I believe, and it's the answers, no matter how odd, that I'm looking for. I started thinking that this creature was just flesh and blood, and now I believe there are connections to either extraterrestrial or paranormal. I just don't know, you know? And I... I, I <laughs> I'm definitely going to be in a minority when I say this, and I'm sure that anybody in the Bigfoot world is probably going to get a mad at me when I say this, but folks, there are absolutely no experts in the Bigfoot world. You hear it all the time. So-and-so is an expert. No, they're not. If they were an expert, they would have the answers. No one has the answers. They, are, they may be an expert in their view or their opinion, but there's no experts. I'm not an expert. There's no experts. All I can do is tell you that I've seen things and I've experienced things that to me makes me think that there is a connection between the paranormal, the cryptid world, and the extraterrestrial world. I have a very good friend of mine who, uh, and, I, and I'm not going to go into a long, I'm actually at the end, I promise, but I, I won't go into a long dissertation about it, but I had a friend of mine who said that he saw a portal open up. He said inside the portal, the air was red, and it was an old dying tree, and he could see it. And he said that these creatures, about three feet long, very stocky, real strong, big red eyes, giant teeth, looked vicious in these little bubbles, these little orange bubbles, floated out of the portal and was coming after him and his buddy. But when they turned their flashlight on, they just disappeared. The portal was gone. They were gone. A few minutes later, he would see this little crackling and another portal would open up. These creatures would come back out. And this happened for three days. Is that right, Claudia? Wasn't it three nights? This went on for three nights. Now, I wasn't there. I can't say it happened. But I can tell you, I trust Adam. And Adam is a very, very well-known uh, cryptozoologist. Cryptologist is what I call him. Um, traveled around the world. He's been on tel television shows, very well known. And the only thing sharing that would do to him is ruin his credibility. So there are things out there and things happen. So I told you earlier that I love quotes. I'm going to end with one of my own. And that is, curiosity leads you to questions. The questions lead you to research. The research leads you to answers. And you have to be willing to accept the answers regardless of what your thoughts and views are. And that is researching with an open mind. Thank you.